This is the climb to the cross, part two. And uh, we're going to go back to Luke chapter 23 and continue our conversation uh, of encounters uh, that Jesus had on the way to the cross. Luke chapter 23, uh, verse 32 through 43, says, Two other men, both criminals. Do you remember last week we talked about Barabbas? Now two other men, and they were both criminals as well, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice about him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, I want you to keep your finger there because we're going to talk about this, but I want you to look at one other passage in Numbers in the Old Testament, chapter 21. You've got to have both of these for it to all make sense. Numbers chapter 21, verse 8 and 9, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and he put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Now, I, I, I want to parallel these two passages, and we're going to have some fun, and we're going to move quickly, so you got to be ready, okay? So you just got to be ready to go, because we have to move fast. Uh, but I, I want to give this to you. Uh, this, this story, Holy Week, uh, Palm Sunday, all of this begins, and, and Jesus is on his way to the cross. We pick up the story here. Now, Barabbas has been released, and if you weren't here last week, you can watch it uh, online, but Barabbas was released, and Jesus was condemned. Jesus took the place of Barabbas. And Jesus took on his own shoulders Barabbas' cross and Barabbas' consequences. So he began to move forward towards the cross. As he's doing that, there are two thieves that are sentenced to death with him. So they're carrying their crosses as well, and they are being crucified with him. So Jesus, the Holy One, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, is being crucified amongst two thieves. He's got a sinner on one side and a sinner on the other side. He's in the middle, hanging there, innocent, done nothing wrong, while he is surrounded by people that deserve to die right where they were. And so as Jesus is, is going up here, I want to talk about this conversation because uh, Jesus is, is, is on his way. He's been beaten severely. If you know anything about the crucifixion and, and how it happened, uh, it is a gruesome uh, a gruesome progression of torture leading up to the crucifixion. And they say sometimes the pain was greater in the preparation than even in the nails going into uh, the, their, the limbs itself. By that time, they had been already so beaten and so wounded and so hurt that that pain was almost less than what they had already gone through. So Jesus is severely beaten. He is severely uh, dehydrated, wounded. He has lost all kinds of blood, and he's crucified with these two criminals, one on each side. In verse 33, it says, When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals. Now, I think this is interesting because these criminals, if you study this, these criminals were friends of Barabbas. Now, we talked about Barabbas last week. The, these were his friends. So you can imagine when they were crucified and they looked to the middle and they didn't see Barabbas, but they saw Jesus, how confused they might be because they knew that Barabbas should be where Jesus was. Some theologians believe that Barabbas was actually the leader 
or the ringleader of, of a ring of thieves that committed crime and that these men looked to Barabbas as their leader. So as they were hung there on the cross, they would look to the center cross and see Jesus hanging in the place, which is so symbolic, hanging in the place that Barabbas should hang. So Jesus is crucified there amongst the criminals. Uh, there are ancient writings that are not the Bible, but the ancient writings, a uh, book of Nicodemus. Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, he wrote a book, and, uh, uh, and he was there at the crucifixion. He was one of the people that buried Jesus after he died. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, uh, they went to the, to the leaders and asked if they could bury Jesus, have his body. So later in the fourth century, Nicodemus wrote a book. And when he wrote this book, he, he actually gave these thieves names. We know them at the, as the two thieves, but he actually gave them names. It was Dismas and Gestus. Dismas and Gestus. So he actually names them because Nicodemus would have been right Right there. He was too afraid to come to Jesus during his life, but Nicodemus showed up after he died, which there's another message there for some another time. But a lot of people wait until it's too late to decide that they want to serve him. They want to serve him, but they wait too late, and, and, and they're too ashamed to do it while he lives, so they wait till he dies. I'm just going to tell you, the move of God can pass you by, and if you wait too long, you'll miss it. You, the, the opportunity of a lifetime has to be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity. And I'm telling you, some of you maybe have waited to just totally commit or to totally jump in in your relationship with Jesus. And I'm just going to tell you, there is no better time to do it than right now. It's go time. It's game day. It's time to make your move. And so here's Jesus hanging there between these thieves. And in verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they are doing, and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Now, I want to draw attention to this because this is interesting. I told you you got to stay with me. i got to move fast. I, I want to tell you a bunch of stories and all that, but i gotta, I got to fly today, okay? So this is interesting because he says, this is Jesus. He's being crucified unjustly, and he says these words that are so famous to us. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, these words are written in the, other, in, in the other Gospels, but what is interesting in the other Gospels is the other Gospels, Matthew and Mark, both mention that the thieves were rebuking, reviling, and insulting Jesus. Both thieves. It says in Matthew that both thieves insulted him. It says in Mark, both thieves insulted him. So they, 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 they reviled him, both of them. But in the writings of Luke, Luke was a doctor. He was very detailed. He includes some things in his letter that none of the other writers uh, include just because by nature of his personality, he was more, uh, more detail-oriented. And so he writes this conversation that he observed that the other two didn't observe, and it was that when Jesus said the words, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing this thief, this second thief, Dismas, that we are talking about today, his heart began to turn. Because if you read on with the story, he begins to observe the conversation between the thief and Jesus. And none of the other Gospels talk about this. But theologians believe that when Jesus uttered the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, it struck something in Dismas because when he looked to the cross where Barabbas should be, Jesus was there, and he knew that he had done nothing wrong. So Jesus there, innocent, Jesus there, hung unjustly, says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they were doing. And theologians believe that when Jesus said those words, that the hardness of Dismas' heart began to crumble. You know what, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. Forgiveness has a powerful effect. There is something about forgiveness that really just sets someone free. People say, well, I don't want to forgive them because they don't deserve to be forgiven. Can I, can I tell you something? You don't forgive for them. You forgive for you. There's an old saying that, that forgiveness is, uh, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting someone else to die. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and you, oh, yeah, I'm going to get them. I'm not going to forgive them. But you die. 
That's what unforgiveness does. Forgiveness has a way of healing the soul. Forgiveness has a way of breaking down barriers. Forgiveness has a way of cracking hard hearts. Forgiveness has a way of changing people that would not otherwise be changed. And I know it gets real quiet when we start talking about forgiveness. But if there's anybody that's in your life that you have not forgiven, the power of forgiveness will set you free. But it will also set them free. I know they might not deserve it. I know they might not have earned it. But why should they keep you in captivity? By you not offering them forgiveness. But forgiveness is not entirely what we're talking about today because in in this story, forgiveness was just the beginning. It was just the first step that began to unlock this man's heart because we see that the insults continue to come to Jesus and Gestus, the other thief, he's insulting Jesus. He is reviling him. And we see this this in in, in this passage. And in verse 41, uh, the, the second thief, he says, we are punished justly. He rebukes the other thief for reviling. Now, he, used, he was the insulter. But when Jesus forgave, something switched in him. It was as if a light came on. And he said, wait a second. This man is dying unjustly. But yet he is offering forgiveness. Something switched in his mind. So now he begins to rebuke his buddy that was insulting Jesus. And in verse 41, he says this. We are punished justly. For we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. The thief has a realization that he is dying justly. He gets it, that I did something and now I deserve death. But at the same exact time, the realization hits him that Jesus did nothing wrong, but yet he's still dying. I would love to have been able to see like a screenshot of the thoughts that went through the thief's mind as he saw this holy figure, I'm, I mean, Jesus, resolute, mind fixed, suffering, not a word to his accusers, not a word of complaint, not a word of condemnation. The Bible says he offered up silence. And as he hung there, he began to utter words that would shake the foundations of the earth. And he would say these, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And it was more for the thieves. It was more than just the people surrounding. It was really a voice and words that would echo into eternity. Because those words were for me and for you. Those words for the people that will come after us. Those words are for our legacy. Those words echo through eternity for years and generations and generations. And so this man is having this conversation. And as they're they're talking, we see this in verse 43. In verse 42, he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This is what he said. He doesn't say, hey, Jesus, can you get me off the cross? He doesn't say, Jesus, could you, like, help me with this pain? He doesn't say, Jesus, can you get me a pardon? Jesus, can you give me a place in heaven? Could you give me a throne right next to yours? That's what the disciple, you remember the disciple? It's like, uh, we're trying to decide who can sit on your right and on your left. Um, the disciples were a crazy bunch. Um, they're a lot more like us than we realize. And so they're, they're like all about the position. You know, they're trying to get, I, oh, Jesus, I've been serving you for a long time. I should be on your right and he should be on your left. It, but, but, but this man in his suffering, he doesn't look for place. He doesn't look for position. He doesn't look for pardon. He asks that Jesus won't forget him. He says, just don't forget me. And I read this text over and over and over again this week. And those words riveted me. I'm sorry to go deep so fast. We came right out of communion. We just got to go right right there. But it just riveted me because he just didn't want to be forgotten. You know what happened in his heart? He said, I want to be where you are. He said, "I I don't have to have what you are. I don't have to have what you have. I just want to be where you are. So wherever you're going, Jesus, just don't forget me. And we know these words in verse 43. Jesus says, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. He says, today you'll be with, you're going to be with me. You're going you're gonna to be, today, 
right now. You, you are going to be with me in paradise. Theologians believe that Jesus was at a point of suffering when this conversation took place, that he was in so much pain that to actually move in any direction would cause excruciating pain throughout his body and accelerate the death process that was impending. And so the, the distance of the crosses from each other would mean that Jesus, to speak to him, would have to turn towards him. So I want you to picture this. Jesus didn't come here for the thief. He came here to die for all mankind. I mean, Jesus is like, it, it, he is on his way. He is the superstar of this scene, and he is on the cross. This is his moment. This is his time. Everything's happening, and then this thief is just like talking to him. It's like, it's not about you. I know what we would say. It's like, hey, shut up. It's not about you, all right? It's like, don't be so selfish, religious Pharisee. You know, is we, we'd be, you know, we'd be a little bit more like, Jesus, you're the star of the show. Do your thing. I just have to suffer where I am. But this guy said, no, no, no. I've got a need, and I'm not going to let this moment pass me by. Jesus, I want to be where you are. And this is how compassionate and how loving Jesus is. He overcomes pain, and he stops his own show. To have a one-on-one, -on -one, a one-on-one -on -one interaction with a man that didn't deserve it. He has a one-on-one -on -one conversation as he's hanging naked, exposed from a cross. He sees fit to turn his body and cause himself more pain just so he can reassure this guy, yeah, I got you. Today you're going to be with me in paradise. How good is God? How good is our Savior that he would go through that, that he would walk through that. And even in the, in, the, in the magnitude, in the enormity of what he was doing, have the compassion to meet him right where he was. Isn't that the greatest picture of our God? Is that even in the midst of everything that God's doing all over the world, even in the midst of billions and billions of people, he has the same compassion towards the one as he does for all of us. It says that he'll leave the 99 to go after the one. This is what Jesus does. He'll go through own self-inflicted pain just so he can have the one-on-one, -on -one, just so he can have the interaction, just so he can reassure this undeserving thief that I got you. This, 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 is, this is like riveting to me. And, I, and I've almost prepared this backwards today because I, I, I want to give you some of these things. Uh, there's, there's a quote that says, Jesus dying there between two thieves. Just picture this. One dying for sin, one dying in sin, and one dying to sin. Two guilty, one innocent. Two paying their debts to society, and one paying our debt of sin. This, and all of what I've said already, is the scene in which I think we can learn some amazing concepts about God. And one of these concepts is very simple, and it's this. Actually, all of them are really simple, but it's this, that it's never too late. See, I don't know what you came in with today, but you need to know this. It's never too late. It is never too far gone. It is never over. We've used this quote a lot lately. If, if, if you're not dead, God's not done. So he says it, it is not too late. Th this could not have been worse timing for the thief. I mean, he, talk about waiting until the very, very, very end. He waits until he's about to breathe his last. And he's like, okay, I got I to do this. He waits, but even in waiting, Jesus' compassion still reached him. He said, it's not too late. Even though you waited that long, even though you waited all of that time, it is not too late. Even in the pain that Jesus was in, he took the time and the effort to turn his head and reassure this man that even that day that he would be with Jesus. Let me just reassure you, it's not about when you come to him. It's if you come to him. We say, well, you got to do it right now. You got to do it. And you should. You absolutely should move. But this is how good God's grace is that even if you don't say yes today, He'll take you tomorrow. And even if you don't say yes tomorrow, He'll take you in 10 years. And even if you don't say yes in 10 years, He'll take you. That's how far His grace goes. I, I don't know about you, but I probably would have a certain line where I would just like, okay, after 10 years, you're cut off. 
I mean, it's just like, it, it's over. You know, like I'm just thinking about Jude as he grows up. And, and uh, you know, uh, he's like 28, still living at the house, still paying for everything. It's like, bro, I love you, but <laughs> you, need, you need to get on with your life. You know, you get moving. He's like, Dad, you know, just give me some more years. I'm trying to find myself. And, and um, yeah, I don't know if you ever heard, heard that before. If you haven't, you haven't hung out with any young adults for a while. Um, I just need some time to find myself. And, and, and so they're in this self-discovery journey. I would have a limit. I would be like, bro, you are 28. Get the heck out of my house. It is time to get on your own feet. I would have a limit. But this is how good God's grace is. He says, I'll be here when you're ready. I'll be here. See, somebody needs to hear that today. He'll be here when you're ready. He'll be here. You felt the pressure. Everybody always on you. You've always grown up in church that push you. You should because it's that important. But here's the thing about Jesus. People usually push you. Jesus waits for you. And as he waits, he'll be there when you're ready. The second thing is that you're never too bad. See, this is how simple the grace of God is. We have this complex story, but then it's, it's divided down into some key concepts that we can learn that are so simple. And it says that, that this is so illustrated that you are never too bad. This guy is the worst of the worst. He's condemned to death. He should be dead. He should die. But Jesus accepted this man in that moment. And this is what is wild to me is that Jesus accepted the man before he changed. Some of you people that have been walking with God for a really long time and you got it all figured out. You're just theologically strong. Let me, let me just propose something to you. He didn't change before he got accepted. He got accepted before he changed. I, I know our flesh wants to, like, stand up on that. Say, no, that's, that's not right. He should have changed first. He should have repented. No, no. He got accepted first. And we don't even know if he changed. But Jesus said, if you have faith in me, if all he needed was a turn from what he was, it didn't matter what, it, going forward, he was going to find a new life and he was going to walk in a new way. But he had to turn from what he had and faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says if we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth, some of us, well, you got to have the right language. People have bar, like argued this for years about the, the sinner's prayer and what you should say. Well, the thief just said, don't forgive me. So for some of you that email me about the sinner's prayer, just FYI, the thief on the cross, his sinner's prayer was, Jesus, please don't forgive me. Because it illustrated a posture. It showed a position of faith that said, I believe. Don't forget me. That's all Jesus is looking for. And you're never too far gone. You're never too late. You're not too bad for the grace of God to reach you or to reach your family members or to reach your mother-in-law or to reach your uncle or to reach your neighbor or to reach your boss. It is not outside the reach of his grace. And the last one is it's never too difficult. It's never too difficult. Could it really be? Could God's love really save this thief in the last moments of his life? It wasn't even about him. Could God's grace really save him? And I remember the scripture, Jeremiah 32, 27, it says, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? God just declares it about himself. You, you got to be bad to the bone to declare something about yourself. You know, it's one thing to say, like, they're great, but to say, I'm great. It's like, whoa, you, you got, you got, you got some, something going on. And, and this, is, this is what God says. He, he says, is anything too hard for me? Is anything? I'll just give you a hint about God. When he asks a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. He, he wasn't, like, really inquiring, guys, is this one too hard? It's like we actually, our opinion matters on it, if he can do it or not. No, he said, is anything? Too hard for God? Isaiah 59 1 says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. We're talking about the thief, and it was the thief's last prayer. Perhaps it was even his first prayer. He knocked once, he sought once, he asked once, he dared everything, and he found everything. That's what the thief did. Asked once, sought once. 
just said yes once, and he found everything. Now I'm going to go to where you might still have your finger in Numbers chapter 21. And I'm going to tell you this verse, and we're going to be done. Numbers chapter 21 is a story that is really um, it's disturbing to say the least because now you got to keep the backdrop of, uh, backdrop of what we just painted and you just need to step into Numbers 21 which is in the Old Testament and if you read Numbers 21 by itself without understanding the entirety of the Bible you'd be very confused by this passage if you did not know the partnership between the Old Testament and the New Testament and the Old Covenant and the New Covenant if you did not understand how those two work together how they fulfill each other then you would look at Numbers 21 and you'd be really uh, discouraged about who God is because it says in Numbers chapter 21 that snakes, and I, I hate snakes, it like, kind of gives me chills to even talk about them, that snakes were crawling around and biting, venomous snakes were biting the people and they were dying. And so Moses goes before God and he says, God help us, people are dying all around us. And this is what God tells Moses. In the light of the picture that we just painted, I want you to hear this. He tells him, he says, I want you to take some brass or some bronze, and I want you to beat it. I want you to shape it into the very thing that bit them. I want you to form it into a snake. And then I want you to take that bronze snake, and I want you to hang it on a pole. And then tell the people that if they look at the snake, then they will be healed. And people have been confused for years about this because why would uh, looking to the thing that bit them save them? Why would looking to a snake that was venomous, that was poisonous, save them? Because it was not about the snake saving them. It was what their salvation had become. It, it, it was what was forced and what was shaped and what was formed. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, God made him, he formed him, he shaped him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus didn't commit sin. He became sin. And what was written in Numbers was a type and shadow of a man that would walk the face of the earth innocent and blameless and he would be beaten and he would be whipped and he would be shaped and he would be formed and he would become a snake. The Bible says cursed is any man that hangs on a tree. So he became for you and he became for me my curse and my snake and my sin. And when he hung on that tree, he became the standard of salvation. And when the thief looked, he was healed. All he had to do, all he did was, all he did was look, Jesus, don't forget me. It was a look. In Numbers 21, it was a shadow. In Numbers 21, it was a type. In Numbers 21, it was a foreshadowing of what Jesus would come to do. And Jesus didn't die as just this wonderful, beautiful Savior up there. He died and became a curse. He became sin so that you and I could go free. He became Barabbas. He became the thief. He became Dustin. He became Bill. He became Charlie. He became us so that we could live. It was us that died on that tree. It was us that died on that cross. It was us that died there. And when he gave his life, forgiveness was bought for you and for me. And this, is, this, this just messes me up. And I'm sorry, I should have entertained you more. I should have made you laugh more. But I just got to get, this is like, this is so powerful. He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But then before he dies, he says this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I got to show you something. If you read all throughout the Gospels, you will never, ever hear Jesus call God, God. He is only Father. But when he became sin, he said, God, 
for the first time, it was not Father, Son. For the first time, it was not Father, Son. For the first time, it was not Father, Son. It was my God, my God. Because he became the curse that was coming at you and coming at your family and coming at me and coming at my legacy. He became everything that tried to bite me. He became everything that tried to take me out. And all it took was the th- from the thief was a look at the Savior and he was healed. And today, all it looks for us is a look at him, a look at the Savior, and you and I are healed and we go free. Whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Thank you, Jesus.